To the world, the cross appears as foolishness. We face problems and we try to find solutions. We're self-reliant. We try to work things out. We face these different issues in our lives and we weigh out what tools we have available and try to put together some sort of a solution and try to figure out a way to move forward. This kind of self-reliance is part of our national identity, part of that rugged individualism that makes us Americans. Ralph Waldo Emerson points to individual authority as the highest good in an essay that he wrote on self-reliance. And, and the essay, don't get me wrong, has some wonderful lines in it. Prayer as a means to effect a private end is theft and meaningless, he says. When it's just about you, is what he's saying. But the gist of his argument is individualism. Reliance on the self, not interdependence, not community, not those of us who gather together week after week as a community of faith, moving forward in unison, in as one voice, with God as our director. The cross runs against this idea. It's about self-sacrifice, putting the other ahead of the self. This past Monday, as I was driving to Rosewood for the weekly Bible study there, by the way, you're all invited. I don't know if everybody knows, you're welcome to come to Rosewood. It's primarily for the residents, but there are some members of the church who come as well, and we have a wonderful discussion each, each Monday. And this past Monday, we were looking at this passage in 1 Corinthians, and as I was driving over there, I was thinking about these words in the epistle, and the foolishness of the world, the wisdom and power of God and how this juxtaposition fits together, I was thinking about where do we get wisdom? That was my opening question for the group. And they had some great answers. But when I got in the car, the radio was still on. I mean, it came on when I turned the car on. And it was in the program 1A. And they were interviewing the author of the book, We the Corporations. Now, the book is picks up that political gaffe from a few years ago when an eloquent politician was answering questions and an accomplished business person and he was a reporter this is a number of years ago and uh, the reporter pushed back hard and he and he said corporations are people too my friend no but they're not corporations exist for one purpose to increase shareholder value now, sometimes they'll do some socially responsible things in order to achieve that end, but corporations exist to increase the price of the stock. That's it. But that's not the reason God is. God is about redemption, transformation. God is about us moving forward, improving, growing. And Paul points out how foolish the cross, and we see all these wonderful cross examples, how foolish the cross is to the world. Those who he calls the perishing don't get it. He uses the word there for moria, uh, the word moria in Greek, which comes from the Greek word moros, which sounds a lot like our modern word moron. And it means uh, absurd or silly, but it has that same etym etymology as moron. He uses the present participle again to contradict the, the, the mora, morias as those who are being saved. And it's interesting to me that he uses the present participle because this is a process that is still in progress. It's still ongoing. He doesn't talk about those who've made it, who have enough ticks in their Sunday school roster and have a gold star next to their name and therefore are, are done. His whole idea is the continuing process of growth in Christ. And he, he brings these two groups in, into contradistinction with one another. And the cross for those who are being saved, those who are here today, those who are watching on YouTube, those who are listening on the radio, the cross is the power of God. It's not foolishness at all. Paul Sampley describes this message as Paul's back to the basics. 
This is where he takes the Corinthians and he lays it out for them. Using these two co contrasting ideas, Paul creates space between seeing the cross as foolishness or moronic and those who truly get it. Those who understand what redemption feels like, what the experience of knowing God is like. He contrasts two of his contemporary groups in Corinth. Corinth. There were the, the Jewish people and there were the Greek people. And the Jewish folks had problems with Jesus. So did the Greeks. And both had problems for different reasons. The Jewish people wanted to see signs. They wanted miracles. They wanted some evidence that they could point to about, yeah, this is the Messiah. We can count on it. We know this is the one. The Greeks were into eloquent speeches, good arguments. If you can assemble your position well and you can prove it to me, the Greeks were satisfied. To those who hear God, to those who experience God, neither is required because Christ is power and wisdom. To build his case, Paul indicts human wisdom. He quotes the second half of Isaiah 29, 14. The wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the discernment of the discerning shall be hidden. There would have been people who would have heard him, who when he quoted that part of the verse, would have immediately thought to themselves the first half of the verse as well which is about a bright promise for the future. As in, this isn't a static thing that's not going anywhere. God is alive. God is powerful. God is active. God is here. God is moving. And that's the message that is transcendent and continues beyond the boundaries of the city of Corinth and continues to today. It can continue to speak to us wherever we are and whatever we're encountering. This is the promise in that passage for us. The cross might seem like foolishness. The Romans put Jesus on trial. They convicted him and they killed him for sedition. And if this were a movie, we would find it an unsatisfying ending. People would complain that the hero didn't overcome the odds and survive. They would protest, he is no hero. He died for crying out loud. Marvel Comics isn't working on a version of this. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom because we see the crucifixion as the end. It would be easy to look around and see all these crosses and say, that's right, our Savior died. What a bummer. He was so good and he had so many good things to say, all those wonderful lessons, and yet, gosh, all these crosses just remind us that it was the end. God says, Ah, joke's on you, because death isn't the end for me. God overcomes death. Paul's challenge to wisdom challenges Christian doctrine. And that's uncomfortable for me, because I've spent so much time enjoying reading Christian doctrine, reading theology, trying to understand these concepts. We know God through human wisdom, through these books and wonderful expressions of who God is. But since those days in Corinth, when people first encountered that epistle, for those who first encountered God there, they've been tempted to, to spell it out into some sort of orthodoxy. Literally, again, not to overplay the Greek, but that means right opinion. We often translate orthodoxy as right thought or right idea or right belief. But Paul says to that, no. I can picture him slamming his hand down. No, no. For him, pistos. The Greek for faith is what matters. Faith is the most important thing. The proper trusting dependence on God to do what God promised. Paul wasn't interested in orthodoxy. Paul was interested in people having faith in Christ, coming together in communion with one another, and then seeking to follow where God leads. When I had the privilege of going to Boston last year with a group of other ministers to talk about the future of the church or the present of the church, uh, church in America. The title was something like uh, Christianity in a Polarized and Politicized America. 
And there are these 30 ministers gathered in these roundtable discussions and we're talking and there was a lot of hand wringing and one conversation seemed to be moving toward this consensus of it's in demise, isn't it? And the question devolved into sort of a what will become of us? We were all ministers after all. And I didn't say anything. And for once, Will, I resisted the urge to, to say something. I, I, I normally am not able to do that. But I, I sat there quietly. And I wanted to say, the future of religion is a human problem. The future of religion, of Christianity, of the church, that's, that's our problem. That's not God's problem. God's bigger than this. God will survive. God will keep speaking and moving. The church may change and evolve, but God is bigger than the church. And if we believe in the power of the cross that all of these different shaped and sized crosses represent, we cannot lament when people recognize the foolishness and walk away. Over two centuries ago, Schleiermacher recognized that things are good and people don't need God anymore. He addressed his speeches to what he called cultured despisers. We have cultured despisers today. Because life today is even better than it was two centuries ago. It's way better than it was 20 centuries ago in Corinth. And people seem to have less and less need for the cross in each generation. Less and less need for redemption. Paul's foolishness of the cross speaks louder and louder all the time. But we go beyond the foolishness to see the transformation. We can lay our troubles at the cross and see the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, not just here, but in every cross we encounter in life. One scholar suggests that Paul plays the buffoon in this, this passage. That he's playing a, a dramatic or a literary part as the buffoon. Because in, in plays or in stories, sometimes it's the fool who is able to convey a deeper truth, especially one that would confront the status quo, one that would disrupt what people think should be the order. The fool can exploit that paradoxical freedom and share dangerous truths. But despite the foolishness, God never went away. Despite the surrender of, the of Christ on the cross, God stayed active. God continued to move. Paul summarizes God's power over human ideas in this complex collection of contrasts. He seems to want to create the largest possible distinction between the wisdom of the world and the truth of God. The grace of preservation and the grace of redemption are one and the same. When we want to go someplace, normally, we try to move in a straight line. If I'm, if I'm here and I want to get to the back of the sanctuary, I wouldn't climb diagonally over the pews. That would take longer, I can recognize. But I would walk down the aisle and walk to the back of the sanctuary. Wherever we're going, we try to go in as straight a path as we can. But with God, we have to submit ourselves to God, to grace, to the foolishness of the cross. To the idea that there is something bigger and more powerful than us that directs our path, or that can. We're not self-reliant. We're God-reliant. We go via con Dios. We go with God. And sometimes that path can take unexpected twists and turns. Sometimes it can take us to a place we didn't expect to be. Sometimes it can even mean putting somebody else first. What do we want in life? What, what is our goal? 
If our goal, if we're being truly honest with ourselves, is something about ourself, we might be missing some of the cross. We might be missing some of the power and wisdom that this cross represents. We might be missing that rich and abundant life that God offers. One where we place the other first and completely and utterly and every step we take on this earth, put God first and the director and author of our lives. Amen.